and welcome to TL Physics and today I'm going to talk about binding energy per nucleon and how we could deal with that in equations and some important parts about it. So in my previous video I calculated the binding energy of carbon-12 here and I worked out the total energy required okay, to take carbon-12 apart into protons and neutrons was um, 0.0957U or 89.14455 mega electron volts. Now, binding energy per nucleon is basically taking that value there <coughs> and dividing it by how many protons and neutrons I have. So in total, I have got six protons and six neutrons, so my nucleon number is 12. So for per nucleon, I'm going to take 89.14455 divided that by 12, so 89.14455, divide that by 12, and I get an answer of 7.43 MeV. So binding energy per nucleon for carbon-12 is going to be 7.43 mega electron volts. Now, if I plotted the values for the binding energy for every single element, so if I went from hydrogen all the way up to sort of the uraniums and the lithium and the actinide series. <coughs> Here, so this is the atomic number, so how many protons and neutrons they have. And this is the binding energy per nucleon. I actually get a graph that looks like this. That the binding energy actually increases into a point, and then after that point, the binding energy decreases. And a really good way of thinking about this, like this, if you had those magnetic balls, if you had loads of little ball bearings that were attached magnetically, when well, there's only a few of them, it's quite hard to rip them apart. And that is because the strong nuclear force is acting upon all of them. So the resultant nuclear, strong nuclear force is quite high because it's acting, every particle is interacting with every other one. So every uh, nucleon is acting with the others. As you get bigger and bigger and bigger, the nucleons start going outside the the size of this atom now is uh, the nucleus is starting to get outside of the um, strong nuclear forces range and what this means what this means here is that the um, strong nuclear force would decrease because the resultant strong nuclear force would be lower which means the binding energy required to rip them apart would also go down okay so to put some random, uh, to put some numbers on it, these are not real numbers, I'm just um, using them for effect. For carbon-12, I need to add 10 newtons of force, or 10 joules of energy, um, to remove the um, electrons. But as I get bigger, so let's get set, let's say the uranium, because the, the strong nuclear force resultant has got a much lower amount, so let's say uh, 8 newtons, I'm going to require a lower amount of energy to um, remove the electrons, uh, remove the electrons, remove the protons and neutrons. And what it means, it, the, the point on this graph which is most important for you guys is the peak, and that is iron. <coughs> iron is known as the most stable element. It is the element that has the highest binding energy per nucleon. Okay, so this is the one that the Electrons, the electrons, the protons and neutrons themselves are feeling one of the strongest uh, resultant uh, strong nuclear forces, which means that I need to put in quite a lot of energy to overcome that. Now, this actually brings up something quite interesting: that if we look at energy transfer, if I my binding energy goes down, this means less energy is required to break it apart, which means that when it's made, it means that less energy is released. So if I took my iron here and I try to add something to it to make it heavier, that means that my binding energy is going to decrease after it, which means that less energy was released than the energy put in. This is, not, this is, this is something that you don't want to happen. You, to balance the energy, the energy has to be, you can't have this idea of less energy than expected being released. So if I am putting in 10 joules of energy, I expect 10 joules of energy to be released. That's, that's the whole idea, that energy is conserved. And the only way that if I was going to add 
a neutron or a proton to iron, for energy to be released, I would actually have needed to put energy in to start with, a lot of it. Okay. So this actually leads us to the idea of fusion and fission and about where it can actually work. Now, one of the rules are is that whatever you make, so the product, must have a higher binding energy than the reactants. <clears throat> so what that means is up to iron, you get a higher binding energy by adding stuff to it, which is nuclear fusion, adding things together. After iron, the only way you get a, um, a higher binding energy is not by increasing the amount of atoms, but is by going, so this is going up, by decreasing the amount of atoms and nucleons, which means nuclear fission. Okay. So at this point of iron, if I try to fuse iron with something higher, my binding energy decreases. So instead of releasing energy, I actually have to absorb energy to make that happen. The same goes the other way. If I try to rip apart iron into smaller pieces, it has a lower binding energy, which means that instead of energy being released, energy is being absorbed. As we know, energy and temperature are linked. Temperature and pressure are linked. So if the energy is being absorbed, so there's a drop in energy, temperature would go down, which means the pressure would also go down. I can liken this to a balloon. For something to have a sudden pressure drop is like popping a balloon. And that is what happens in a star when it has got undergone, basically, nuclear fusion of iron, and the star then basically supernovas. It explodes, much like a balloon with a sudden pressure drop. So this idea that the products must have a higher binding energy than the reaction, so the one side of the reaction must have a low, um, higher binding energy than the other, and that means that energy was released. I'm going to give you an example of that now with um, <coughs> this reaction here. I've got deuterium I'm going into uh, two deuterium, this is nuclear fusion, going into uh, helium and a neutron here. And I need this information that uh, deuterium has 1.1 mega electrovolts per nucleon and helium 3 has 2.57 per nucleon. So how I do these is it's kind of like the mass deficit I will write underneath the equation. So this is per nucleon and hydrogen or deuterium has two of these so I need to times this by two. So that's 2.2 MeV. Here again would be 2.2 MeV. Helium is going to be 2.57 times 3, sorry, which is 7.71 MeV. And this is important. When you do mass deficit, you do include the neutron. But when you're looking at the binding energy, neutrons are not bound to anything, so they don't have a binding energy. So what I've got here is I've got 4.44. MeV goes to 7.71 MeV and as you can see I've got a difference here and the difference is of 3.27 and that is the energy that's going to be released in this reaction. So plus 0 and plus 3.27 MeV which is the energy released. Okay, so it's important that you realise that this neutron doesn't have any binding energy. Okay, and that is telling me how much energy I would have been released in total. Now, it wouldn't be a plus, that would be a minus. Now, you actually don't really mind about the sign, because of course, when you're looking at the binding energy, you're looking inside the atom, and this energy is being released outside of the atom. Okay. So you're not too worried about the sign. What you care about is that there is a difference, that there is some energy that needs to be changed or some mass that needs to be added 
because it's gone missing and to balance each side of the formula. What you are interested in is that difference. So that here, this difference to balance both sides of this equation is the energy that is released. Much like in a mass deficit where you have energy, you have a mass missing and you add that mass to the other side and that is the energy released. <laughs> Sorry about that. So what we have here is the idea of um, binding energy per nucleon and how we can use that information to be able to work out how much energy was released from an atom. What I've also done is I have put on uh, this idea of a graph of binding energy. You may be asked to read some information about this. Okay, Just a quick reminder, if you get any data from this, this is per nucleon which means you do have to times about how many nucleons you've got. But this whole idea of iron being the most stable atom, it has the most binding energy per nucleon. It has the strongest resultant force, strong nuclear force, holding it together because they're all interact. Every nucleon is affecting every other nucleon. And that there is binding energy per nucleon. 